we are grateful today for this youth choir and for how they've ministered for this young woman of God, for how anointed these young people are, and for this awesome woman of God who has read, led the praise and worship all morning, and for the director and the musicians. The atmosphere has been set and charged and prepared for the planting of the seed of the word. We're grateful for that because you have to work behind the scenes for that. I've been in places when you get up to preach and you have to kind of turn the soil over yourself. But it's good when it's set and ready and prepared. We're grateful today to be here. I am so thankful to your senior pastor, Dr. Melvin O'Marina. He was gracious enough. Give the Lord. Thank the Lord for your pastor, for your leader, for the under shepherd, for the sacrifices that are made. You never know what goes on behind the scenes. The nights that he tosses and turns and prays for you and for your children and your situations. You have no idea. I think it takes the first lady, a wife of the pastor, to understand and recognize the depths that are gone to, the width and the height of the love and the compassion and the mercy that God reveals and shows. And the people of God need to understand that pastors in particular need to be covered. They need to be prayed for often. There's a scripture that talks about the ointment. Flies got in the ointment and caused the ointment to stink. But the only way the flies can get in the ointment if it's the cover is off. So if you keep a prayer covering over him, the ointment will be fresh and not rancid. See, we're talking about spiritual stuff here. We're go talking about going into the deep things of God, into the superior realm where there is su supernatural places where God wants to take his people, but we are so accustomed to being in the outer court Anybody could go into the. But the inner sanctuary where the presence of God is, where the Ark of the Covenant was, which represented the presence of God, everybody can't go in there. Once a year, the high priest would go in with the blood of the sacrifice. And if he wasn't right, sometimes he had to stay awake all night long so he wouldn't defile himself in his dreams. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Once a year to present the blood for himself, for his sins, and for the sins of the people. And if he wasn't right, they had bells around the bottom of his garment. He would drop dead in the Holy of Holies. And you knew, good, you knew better than to go in. They took a rope and pulled him out. Oh, that's not the message. Help me, Holy Ghost. I'm just talking about covering. I'm talking about praying. I'm talking about intercession. I'm talking about the word of God says that, that, the, that the Lord, the, Isaiah said, they were looking for someone to stand in the gap and make up the hedge and they could find none. Somebody has to be committed to making the sacrifice. It's work. There's an anointing and presence of power of God that God wants to release to his people and in this place, but it comes with sacrifice. It comes with a cost. It costs to be the boss. Everybody wants to tell somebody what to do, but nobody wants to pay the price. And much of what we see is a pseudo anointing. It looks like, acts like, preaches like, testifies life, but it's fake. Because the anointing destroys the yoke and lifts the burden. So if you come in and leave the same way, I don't know if you've been in the anointing. We need power in this hour to shift and change the environment wherever you go. We need change agents on our jobs. 
We will need people who are going to intercede for these 200 missing girls in Africa. While we having tea parties. Ooh, Jesus. We need an anointing and a presence from God that comes from being behind the veil. Turning over your plate and not eating or drinking. So that you can make a difference. Even in your neighborhood, in your schools, in your community. And in the hospitals and wherever you go. Because God wants us to make a difference. He wants us to be transformers. Time out for status quo. The same old, same old, doing the same thing the same way and getting the same result. Somebody said that's insanity. When are you going to make up your mind? People coming in this house that needs deliverance all dressed up and living at hell in their homes. Afraid of their own children. And here we come. Playing games. It's a new day. It's a new season. It's a new dimension. New elevation. New plateaus. New horizons. For those that are willing to pay the price. I guarantee you it's worth it. You can change your environment wherever you go. I remember the Lord told me husband left the pastor and I was assisting him. Sometimes you get tied up and get tied up in titles and positions because that makes you feel like you're somebody. What am I going to be? You know, you're no pastor anymore. What are you going to be? What am I going to do? The Holy Ghost said, if you're not concerned about titles or positions, they will know that you have been with me. That's what's going to make the difference, the anointing and presence of God. Well, there is a word. Well, let me finish my I celebrate. For, you may be seated. First Lady Shelley Mariner, Pastor Derek Barbie, and the Keepers of the Flame. Also, uh, my family is here today. I have a daughter, not in law, but a daughter in love. Would you stand, Michelle Warner? That's my daughter in love, not in law. And then I have a very special granddaughter, Ariel Warner, would you stand? Her freshman year at West Virginia University, first semester, got a four-point average. Come on, somebody. Celebrate and don't hate. And then there's my nephew, my godson. Robert Joyce, I call him Robert. Stand up, Robert Joyce. God bless you, man of God. You are the man of God. You're a man of prayer. There's an anointing on your life, and you will fulfill your destiny. You will live and not die and declare the wondrous works of God. In Jesus' name. And then is there my sister, my armor bearer, Minister Margaret DePina. Yes. Who was born when I was nine year, years old and my mother was very sick, wasn't supposed to have any more children, but we begged my mother for a, a, a sister and I, I don't know if she answered that request or what happened. But all I know is she's here. <laughs> and so I had to feed her, my mother was sick and change her and bring my schoolmates home from school at nine years old and let them see baby sister. So here she is, my sister and my daughter celebrate her. And I would re be remiss if I didn't honor the memory of my mother, the Reverend Delesta Taylor Hassel, who the pastor was talking about uh, how essential it is that our children see us pray that was the model that I saw. I saw my mother on her knees, praying always on the side of her bed, reading her word, 
and she was called to be a preacher years ago when preachers were not accepted in the traditional Baptist church. And, and so much so the call was on her life because of her indoctrination about that. She didn't believe in female preachers herself until the call was so great because how many know woe is me if I don't preach this gospel? If you are called, we're not talking about a career path that you chose. We're talking about a call. We're not talking about a local call. We're talking about a long distance call. So she became a pioneer in the Baptist tradition and was ordained a preacher, a model to women in ministry. Thank God. I'm grateful today for all of you mothers and for you men who've come to represent and to support and to let your mothers and sisters and aunts and everyone know that you appreciate them. We're here different from women from distant seasons in our life. And in the definition and the sense of mothers, when we ask mothers to be stand, sometimes if you haven't given natural birth, women don't stand, but your spiritual mothers and adoptions and guardianship and foster or surrogate mothers, babysitters and nannies, you've mothered. Educated and teachers, you're mothered. You've come alongside someone, spoken to their lives, made a valuable contribution, deposited in their development, mentored, counseled, disciplined, interceded. You're a mother. Mothers give birth and life. They create, incubate, gestate, and produce. They give rise to something. And we thank God for you. Now we believe that we have sought the Lord, and God was so gracious and so kind that he gave a specific word for the seven and nine o'clock a service congregation I call them and now I believe that God has another word for you because God wants you to know how special you are God wants you to know that you are designer originals and he also want me to tell you he created you uniquely and and distinctly different than anybody else so he told me to tell you you are designer original so stop trying to become a knockoff copy because an excellent copy is an inferior original. Just be who you are. Become the best that you can be in God. Well, if you scan for the scripture text, Matthew 8, 23 to 27, the title of the message is Calming the Storms of Life. Matthew 8, 23, 27. Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebu rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and waves obey him? Father God, in the name of Jesus, you have been faithful. I thank you, Lord, that you have allowed me to come to this house, a house of prayer, and given me the privilege and honor to speak into the lives of your people, your sheep. I would say nothing or do nothing that would injure, hurt, or bruise them, for they belong to you. So now speak, Holy Spirit, restore and renew, and I will be careful to give you the praise, the honor and glory in Jesus' name. You may be seated, Matthew 8. Hmm. Chapter 7, 5 through 7 um, in, the, uh, in Matthew is the Beatitudes, and it contains uh, a brief illustration of the Spirit of the Lord, it gives advice about the personal and private nature of a relationship with God, and includes what we call the Lord's Prayer. It teaches us in these chapters 5 through 7 how to avoid seduction in the pull of the world and you avoid it by trusting in God and seeking his kingdom and righteousness. It includes the well-known golden rule, just do unto others as they do unto you. Spike Lee said it like this, just do the right thing. 
It's a caution against judging. Judge not that you be not judged. A warning to beware of false prophets. And a final admonition to find to found ourselves on solid ground by not only hearing but by doing the word of God. You need to understand that it's only the application of the word of God that will change your life and empower you to live a victorious, overcoming life from day to day. Too many of us come to church on Sunday. We hear a good word, but unless you apply what you hear, it has no value. You have to live out the word of God and you have to continue and continue when the enemy would try to discourage you and make you think that no matter what you do or how you're doing it, it's just not going to change your circumstances. But I've come to tell you that he's a liar and the father of lies. The Bible says the kingdom of God suffered violence and the violent take it by force. You've got to press into your blessing. You got to keep on keeping on. Even when the symptoms come back, when your body is sick and God has told you that you're healed, you've got to say to yourself, I'm well. You got to take God at his word. You got to stand on the integrity of God, the immutable word of God. Because I come to tell you that the word of God is exact, it's precise, it's infallible, it's unerring, it's unimpeachable. And if God said it, he'll do it. If he planned it, it's going to come to pass. You got to keep on trusting. You got to keep on toiling. You got to keep on pressing. You got to keep on fighting. You got to keep on struggling. You got to keep on keeping on. This was the backdrop leading up to chapter 8. Leading into this scripture, it opens with Jesus descending, coming down from the mountain. And when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will. Be thou clean, and immediately his leprosy was cleansed. The mountaintop experience experience prepares us for the valley of service. Just know that when you've enjoyed a season of victory, triumph, and joy, that the anointing of God on your life from his presence on the mountain will accompany you in the valley of testing and ministry. Nothing happens in our lives without God's foreknowledge or permission. God is not a masochist, and he does not derive pleasure from subjecting you to abuse or physical pain. Neither does he coerce or force you into submission in obedience to his will or plan for your life. God never overrides your free will or violates your freedom of choice. Forcing one's will on another human being is witchcraft. God is not into hog tying or twisting your arm behind your back. God is not into mud wrestling, although that's where he found us in the mud. But he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and out of the mire. Those are tactics utilized by the devil. God, you see, initiated this love relationship with us. He wooed and courted us from the beginning. We were not looking for God, but God came looking for us. So he came to seek and save the lost. So the good shepherd left the 99 and searched for the one that was lost. So aren't you glad about it? That should make you shout right there. Because God found you in your mess. God found you in the crack house, in the dope house, in the club house. And some of you he found in the outhouse. I don't know about you, 
you've probably been saved all or most of your life. Uh, I'm so glad of the transparency of pastor today, how he talked about how he did some things that he recognized that he went through, but in the meantime, his mother was praying for him. Too many times we're not willing to say we have not been perfect. Uh, behold, the Bible said, I was shaping in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. That's what David said. Well, if it makes you feel better, I know you think you've been perfect all your life. I just want to tell you that it's not your fault. You came into the world with an Adamic nature that you inherited from Adam and Eve. Well, some of you still feel like you've been saved all of your life, but I'm going to take you to Romans that says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We could help somebody if we'd be honest and transparent. Just admit we haven't always been saved. You weren't born an evangelist. You didn't come out of the womb a missionary. You were not a preacher when you were born or a Sunday school teacher. Before you got saved, you hung out at the club and the after hour joint too. I wish somebody here would be honest. You're quiet up in here, but somebody needs to be willing to tell the truth. You would smile on somebody's face uh, and all the time you were trying to take their place. Uh, nothing but a backstabber. Uh, before the Lord touched you, uh, you may have been a prostitute. Uh, oh, I know you were not standing on a corner soliciting, uh, but you took pride in being a kept woman, uh, the sugar daddy that paid your rent and your car note. Uh, but I've come to tell you same, same uh, goods for services. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Just a little more sophisticated. Just a little more dressed up. Before you were converted or transformed, a drug dealer now has been converted to a deacon. The player became a preacher. You need to tell the world, yes, these unsaved men and women, yes, I had my problems, but the Lord saved me. The Lord looked for me. Yes, you need to tell somebody I had an abortion or a baby out of wedlock, and it was wrong but the same God that forgave me will forgive you and all you have to do is repent and ask forgiveness for your sins and do an about face don't keep repeating the same mistake you need to do a one 180 degree turn because to the utmost Jesus saved. He told the woman caught in the act of adultery, go and sin no more. He'll pick you up and turn you around. He'll plant your feet on higher ground. He can turn a stumbling block into a stepping stone. Tell them he turned a drug addict into an evangelist, a street woman into a church mother, a lesbian into a missionary. Come on here, somebody. Give God some glory. You know you've been there and done that. Sitting up there looking pious like you never did. That's why you can't help nobody. Jesus. Tell them about your pain and what really brought you to church. Tell your testimony that you never told. Tell them you were naked and your umbilical cord was still tied. That God found you lying in your blood. And when the Lord found you, you were in trouble, discouraged, and depressed. You had nowhere else to go or no one to turn to. But you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus delivered you. Can I get a witness up in here?
before you are. Somebody pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for my strength right now. Before you wore the long choir robes, uh, girl, you know you wore those short, tight, hot pants. Uh, and now they call them Daisy Dukes. Uh, and you're looking at her uh, and judging. The reason you stopped wearing those spandex pants, because uh, the Holy Spirit's ministry to convict and convince of sin, righteousness, judgment, and thank God, since you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, he convinced you uh, those spandex pants uh, just can't expand anymore. Can I get a witness? Come on. The Holy Spirit has to work in the lives of those still wearing those do daisy dukes uh, like he worked in your life. Uh, you've not always been mother superior. Uh, you've not always been sister wonderful uh, or evangelist preacher got it going on. Uh, if any man or woman be in Christ, uh, he or she a new creation. Uh, old things are passed away. I need somebody to pray for me. All things become new uh, in Jesus. Jesus' name, as far from me, I was seeking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, a very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters lifted me, now safe and I, love lifted me, love lifted me. All that God allows to happen in our lives, the good, the bad, and the ugly, according to the immutable word of God, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. God has a goal in mind for you and me to conform us to the image of his son. He is purposeful in all he does and permits. For whom he did foreknow simply means he knew you before your existence. You're here because of a divine appointment and God has a plan for your life. So what if your mother put you up for adoption? At least she gave you birth. Her womb was the ark that carried you to the fullness of time of your birth. So what if your father did not recognize the value of seeing you grow up? It's his loss. He may not give you, gave you, given you his name, but he can't take back his DNA. He may not have paid child support, but he can't deny contributing his chromosome. He may not have been there to see you graduate or play ball, receive your doctorate or law degree, but it was his genetic code that made you the athlete that you are. The entertainer that you're going to be, uh, the minister who will go to the nations. He served his purpose. He was just a donor. Hey. Ooh, somebody say help a God. Destiny is generational. It was in your granddaddy's loins. Your father's seed carried potential and promise. Well, you're still not convinced that you're not here by accident. So can I argue my case? An egg is released from a woman's ovary once a month and travels through the fallopian tube to the uterus. And while in the fallopian tube, there's a 24-hour period in which it may be fertilized, a male releases 
200 to 400 million sperms or seed at one time, but fewer than 200 actually reach the fallopian tube. It takes five minutes to six hours for the seed to reach the egg, depending on the seed's mobility, because it uses its tail to move. And when the seed reaches the egg, it surrounds the egg, and the seeds shed their outer membrane. And the head of the seed has an enzyme that breaks down the outer membrane of the egg and allows for passage of just one single seed. And once the seed is in the egg, it changes its configuration, and no more seeds are allowed to enter. While well, you were among the 200 to 400 million seed released from your father's loins. And when you were released from your daddy's loins, you used your tail to swim, outmaneuver, and out jockey all the other seeds. Some of you may remember when they got mad with you, when grandma was sick of you. She said, go somewhere and sit your little fast tail down. Now you have the true revelation. You was the fastest of them all. God predestined your life. Now you have a true revelation. He predestined your life. That's why your mother's womb did not become your tomb. So why should you succumb now? You were predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. God determined in advance of your birth, before your conception, that you would come to have the same form or character of his only begotten son, our elder brother Jesus. We were adopted into the royal family of God by faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Father desires to shape us after Jesus image and his character so whatever he permits to happen is character building blocks in our lives and those that have been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son he's called us with a holy calling in whom we call he justified he treats us just as if we've never sinned he dropped the charges against us and declared us not guilty. Sinlessness based on Jesus' righteousness in whom he justified, he also glorified. So if you are in the will of God, walking in obedience to his word, have not taken yourself out of his hands, because no man can snatch you from his hands, but you can remove yourself because sin separates from the Most High. God, who is absolutely holy and absolutely pure, cannot tolerate sin. That's why Jesus cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The storms of life will come and go. Somebody said you're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or about to go into a storm. But God is not slack as a man, men consider slackness. Every storm, whether natural or spiritual, has a lifespan of its own, a length time of time that's ordained by God. He knows just how long it will take, how severe the tests and trial, how hard the gale force winds need to blow on your life to shape and mold you, to form the character of Jesus within us so that we can accurately represent him to a lost, dying, and perishing world uh, to form Christ in you, uh, the hope of glory, uh, to develop a character and a disposition uh, to deliver us uh, from that haughty, arrogant, nasty spirit uh, into a lifestyle that reflects the life of Jesus. Uh, we, are he we are our heavenly father's children, uh, and he knows just how much we can bear. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a hurricane, 
cyclone or typhoon, which are considered the same in different areas of the world. Because we're different, what may feel like a hurricane to you may be of cyclone proportion to me. What might feel like a cyclone to me huh, may be a typhoon to you. Huh. Whatever the case, the wind velocity huh, determines the category rating. Huh. The category ratings are based on the wind speed of the storm. Huh. A category one is 120 to 155 miles an hour. Huh. A category two is a 155 to 178 miles an hour. Huh. A category three is 179 and 200 to 210 miles an hour. A category four is a 210 to a 10, 250 category. And then there's the category five, 250 miles per hour. There's only been six category five hurricanes that have occurred in the Western Atlantic or Gulf of Mexico since 1969. But you don't understand, preacher. Huh? I'm experiencing a category five. Huh? 250 mile wind velocity huh? is blowing in my life right now. Huh? I had a typhoon last year huh? when I lost my job, my house, huh? my car, and my husband. Huh? My baby ran away from home. Huh? But I'm glad I still have peace. Huh? I'm glad I didn't lose my mind, huh? kill myself or somebody else. It may have been the diagnosis of cancer or some other life-threatening disease. The doctor may have told you they've done all they can do. The prognosis may be dim, but I've come to remind you. i come to encourage you. If Jesus is on board, if he's in your boat, there is hope. We need hope to cope. If he is built Jesus is with me. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but a holy lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock. Come on, somebody. You act like you ain't. I stand all on the ground. It's sick and sick. You need to stop leaning on Johnny. You need to stop depending on Harry. You need to stop looking for Lucas because he ain't going to show up when you need him. Christ is there in the midnight hour when your pillow is soaked with plain. When he fell asleep and he's snoring and your heart is broken. You call upon the Lord. He said, I will hear you when you cry. I'll answer you before you stop speaking. Do you know what I'm talking about? Anybody Anybody try him? Anybody know he'll be there when nobody else is there? When your heart is shattered in pieces? When I got the news my nephew killed himself? All I remember was falling on the floor. All I remember was crawling on the floor. I didn't know for three days that I was in shock. When I came to, I realized I'd been in a fog. But I made up my mind. I said, God, I'm not going to let this pain go to waste. Uh, ladies, you know when you gave birth uh, that every contraction, uh, if you use it properly, uh, I'll push that baby through the birth canal. There must be something you want to birth through me. Something I've never birthed before. I'm going to put this pain to use. I'm not going to let the devil play that game. What I could have, should have done. I'm not taking responsibility for somebody else's decision. But what I will do, I'll use it to the glory of God. So I bind the spirit of suicide. In the name of Jesus, I bind the spirit of self-hatred and self-loathing. I bind the spirit of self-destruction. If the devil, if something tells you to kill yourself, you better know it's not the spirit of God. It comes out of the very pit of hell. God, how shall I use it? I'm not going to cloak it in secrecy. I'm not going to cloak it in shame. I'm going to tell them what happened. 
uh, because when I called upon the Lord, uh, he picked me up off that floor. Uh, he stood me back on my feet. Uh, he said, I got something for you. Uh, I'm going to send you to the nations. Uh, if you can take it, uh, you can make it. Uh, yes, God, uh, what is it that you require of me? Uh, this thing is hard. Uh, this thing hurts. Uh, but I'm going to push uh, until something happens. Uh, I'm going to pray uh, until something changes. Uh, I want the anointing uh, that comes with this tragedy. Uh, somebody give God some prayer. You are a lie, devil. You're a bald faced lie. Woo. God help me. In the mouth are two or three witnesses. Every word shall be established. So the Bible tells us in Mark 4 35 and 41. In the same day, when the evening was come, he saith unto them, Jesus. Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship. Jesus was asleep on a pillow, and they wake him and said, Master, Carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. There was a great calm. He said, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to the another, What manner of man is this? That the wind and sea obey him. The text does not indicate the category of the storm they were experiencing, but it does reveal the waves beat into the ship so that not only was it taken on water, but the ship was full of water. And although we don't know the wind velocity, we do know from Mark's account, it was a natural storm phenomena known as a storm surge, which is high water levels piling up as water is dragged into the ship by heavy degrees. Debris, debris, uh, debris that is carried by the water also contributes to the damaging of the ship. Uh, and some of you have excess debris uh, and you've been left with STDs. Uh, somebody took your credit card to the limit. Uh, it doesn't take a meteorologist to figure out uh, if the ship continues to take on water, it's going to eventually sink, sink and capsize. And here Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship. Uh, the stern, which is the back of the ship, uh, asleep on a pillar. Uh, hinder also means impede, delay, or prevent, uh, which suggests Jesus was in a position of disadvantage. Uh, the disciples awoke and said, uh, Lord, that you care that we're perishing. Uh, don't you care that we're going to die? Uh, uh, perish not only means to die, uh, but die in a violent or untimely manner. This would not help had been a death from natural causes, but they were perishing at sea in a violent storm. Jesus arose, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, peace be still, and the wind ceased. Well, I come to tell you, when Jesus is on board in the midst of your personal storm, in the midst of your mess, and your trauma and your drama, no matter how devastating it may appear to be, regardless no matter what seems to be unconquerable odds uh, that you don't think you can beat. When the omnipresent one is on board, the one who's always present with you, who promised never to leave or forsake you. When your husband deserts you or left you a widow, when your wife runs away with another man, worse yet your best friend, when your children grow up and leave you alone or come back home to live with all those grandchildren, the omnipresent one who is here, there, and everywhere, you have have nothing to fear for God has not given us a spirit of fear but power and love
love and soundness of mind because fear is false evidence appearing will I trust in God I don't know about you wherever I may be upon the land and upon the raging sea come what may from day to day my heavenly father watches over me on board the ship was a agape love perfect love not filial love which is brotherly love where the city of Philadelphia was named after on board the ship was agape love not eros love exotic stimulating tantalizing your flesh love that arouses your sexual desires but when desire has reached its peak when it's been fulfilled then what? But God so loved the world, God so agape the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, whosoever believeth in him shall not die a violent or untimely death, but they shall have everlasting life. Agape love is spread abroad in the heart by the Holy Ghost. It's the love that endures long. It's the love that's patient and kind. The love that is never envious. It doesn't boil over with jealousy. It's not boastful or vainglory. It does not display itself haughtily. Agape love is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. It's not rude or mannerly and does not act unbecomingly. Agape love does not assist on its own right or its own way, for it is not self seeking. It's somebody praying for me. A godly love is not touchy or fretful. A godly love is not resentful. A godly love takes no account of evil. It pays no diff attention to, to suffer wrong. A godly love does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoice when right and truth prevail. It bears up under anything and everything that comes. See, too many of you have thrown in a towel. Too many of you have given up. A godly love the beat believes the best of every purpose person. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances and and it endures everything without weakening. It's a love that never fails. It's a love that doesn't fade out. It's a love that doesn't become obsolete. So Jesus arose. Arise means to get up from a sitting or prone position. To move upward and ascend. To come into being. A Mark's account said he rebuked him. See, he said peace be still. A peace and chill in the name of Jesus. Jesus. Is it any wonder that the creator of the heavens and earth can speak to his creation and the creation has to obey his commands? The mastermind exercises dominion over his creation. The earth continues to rotate on its axis. The sun follows his orders, arises in the east and sets in the west. A Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, Satan, and Uranus, a Neptune and Pluto are synchronized. The earth can't quake, the mud can't slide without his consent. He is the master designer. Oh, yes, he is. He is the maker and creator of the wind. And Jesus said, peace, a chill. So why are you so fearful, he said. He said, I told you uh, that we're going to cross over to the other side. It was a statement assuring them of safety was a loaded question. Why are you so full of fear? How is it you have no faith in my promise, my word? When I told you from the beginning, you will make it safely to the other side. Jesus could sleep in the stern of the ship, the place of impediment, delay, or prevention, because he knew that he was not going to die in a shipwreck or see, he had come to earth with a mission and with a purpose. His destiny on earth was to go to Golgotha's Hill, the place of the skull, and die on the old rugged cross. Be buried there three days and three nights in the bowels of the earth, like Jonah, the Old Testament type, foreshadowed Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But on the third day, he rose from the dead. He got up with all power in heaven and earth he voluntarily gave his life yes he did but the bible said they feared 
exceedingly. And when he was come to the other side, into the country of the Gerzines, they came over to the other side. Confirmation, they made it over as Jesus had promised. You that have been washed in the precious blood of Jesus, baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, do you believe the promises and word of God? The same God that promised the disciples they would make it over safely to the other side speaks us to us, no matter what you're going through. He who created the winds controls the wind velocity. God told me to tell you, just praise him in the middle of the storm. Because the storm is passing over. Hallelujah. The devil thought he had you. I cried, but I'm still here. So throw yourself a victory card. Praise him in the midst of the 